Father Michael McGivney, founder of the Knights of Columbus, the world's largest Catholic fraternal organization, will soon be declared blessed. It's just a step prior to sainthood. Father Michael McGivney was not only the remarkable founder, but also the exemplary pastor who sacrificed his own life for serving his people during the pneumonia pandemic in 1890. In this special episode, we will discover the life, work, and legacy of a simple American parish priest who hears our prayers and, with God's grace, can perform miracles in our lives. Pope Francis advanced the cause of Venerable Father Michael McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus, on June 19th, recognizing the miracle attributed to his intercession. The canonization cause started in 1996 in the Archdiocese of Hartford, Connecticut, and in March 2008, Pope Benedict XVI declared McGivney venerable, recognizing his heroic virtues. Since 2008, the cause has been held in Rome by Dr. Andrea Ambrosi. Now that it is over, there will be a beatification scheduled for October 31st. It is not known whether this COVID-19 will be finished on October 31st. Dr. Ambrosi has worked in the drafting of the document called Posizio. The document is decisive for proving scientifically the supernatural strength of Father McGivney's ability to answer prayers. It gives the account of the miracle that was decisive in his process of beatification. And it is strange that the miracle happened to an unborn child in the womb of a mother. In the summer of 2014, she became pregnant and it was her 13th child. She, the mother, was already 41 years old. In January 2015, she had an MRI or CT scan and saw that he had fetal hydrops. Fetal hydrops means there are accumulations of water in various parts of the body. He had it in his lungs, it was in his pancreas, in his head, everywhere and it is a fatal disease but the father of this child is an agent of the knights of columbus an insurance agent and he had one for the many sales he had had a trip to rome and fatima In Rome, the family prayed for the health of their little baby in St. Peter's Basilica, where many chapels were recently restored by the Knights. They asked Venerable Father McGivney for his intercession, and the father promised to name the child Michael after Father Michael McGivney. When she came back, she had the examinations again, and fetal hydrops had disappeared, and all the doctors, there were various doctors questioned, in Nashville, there is a large Vanderbilt hospital that is very, very good. It's very famous. They all said something like, that was absolutely incomprehensible. It was a great joy for the parents and the siblings to welcome a little boy named Michael, child number 13 of the large loving family. He was born in 2015, so now he's five years old. Yes, he's a child who's doing very well, very well. So it's a good case, really, it was a good case. Venerable Father Michael McGivney himself was born in a large family and by coincidence, he also was number 13, just like little Michael. <laughs> 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 
After the break, we will travel to New Haven in Connecticut in the United States to discover the life of Father Michael McGivney. This is the city of Waterbury in the state of Connecticut. Once nicknamed the Brass City, Waterbury used to be an industrial hub. And on a road just outside the city and overlooking the Nakatuck River, Father James Sullivan brings us to the birthplace of Father McGivney. I'm holding a map of Father McGivney's plot plan from when he's born, a very small house where you can't see it from here, but there's a river right behind us. At the time of Father McGivney, a great amount of industri industry was coming to this area. In fact, in the background, you, you hear a factory and some of the machines going at that time. So there are no houses here any longer, but this is the very spot where Father McGivney, his mother, father, his brothers and sisters all lived in his childhood years, his childhood memories. This is the view that Father McGivney would have seen every morning when he woke up. Michael was born in 1852 to Irish immigrant parents, Patrick and Mary McGivney, both of whom were devout Catholics and nourished his faith from a young age. They prayed for their children, and they prayed for him specifically, that the gift of faith be born in him in his earliest age, but he also was influenced by his priest. Michael attended the local district school, but left when he was 13 years of age to work in the brass mills, making spoons, but it wasn't long until he left to join the seminary. He was in his early teenage years. At first, his father was not uh, crazy about the idea. And then, uh, of course, the family was overjoyed when he became a priest. In the middle of the city of Waterbury is the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception, where Michael was baptized. Monsignor John Joseph Bevins has been serving here for years and feels a sense of pride. It's very exciting to learn about somebody who grew up in this city who was so holy. As a matter of fact, when I did baptisms here, I used to show the people his baptismal record and say, what happens at this font is very important. You, your child could end up like Father McGivney. He uh, exemplified everything that's best about Catholic priesthood. I just had such a great pride that, um, that a man who was being considered for sainthood walked these streets. Beside the basilica in a neighboring building is a beautiful room called Father McGivney's Parlor. This was painted within the last year and it's a beautiful painting of Father McGivney and Father Thomas Conway, the World War II chaplain who went down to the USS Indianapolis. And Father McGivney's dressed in white, sort of pulling and leading Father Conway out of the Pacific Ocean, pointing the way to heaven. Uh, the four marks of the Knights of Columbus are on the ceiling, in this part of the ceiling. The angel holding the heart, symbolic of charity. The other angel holding the chain, symbolic of unity. The other angel holding the American flag, symbolic of patriotism. And the two priests embracing each other, symbolic of fraternity. Over here is St. Michael the Archangel holding the flag of the Knights of Columbus. And this part of the ceiling is a holy family, so central to the life and mission of Father McGivney, the unity of the family. And then over in this corner of the ceiling is the Holy Spirit moving from darkness into light. Father James Sullivan is from this city and has been devoted to Father McGivney for many years. My love for Father McGivney started at a very early age, probably around the age of 18. When I went to Providence College, my uncle was there. He's a Dominican friar. He resurrected essentially a defunct council at that time. 550 young men from Providence College joined the Knights of Columbus. I and my brothers were among them, and that's when it started. And then I was in business long before becoming a priest, and so I bought a house near where Father McGivney served in Thomaston, and every week I would go and just visit the graves and the, the cemetery where he visited, and I felt even closer to him as I got older. And then little did I know that kind of following in his footsteps in a certain sense, that one day I would also be called to become a priest. 
40 minutes from Waterbury is the city of New Haven, a coastal city and the largest in the state of Connecticut. This is where Father McGivney arrived as a newly ordained priest to serve here at St. Mary's Parish, where Father John Paul Walker is now the pastor. There's an incredible sense of history here and a great sense of holiness. And as pastor, when I'm just walking through the church, I'm very aware that I'm following in the footsteps of a man that I and many of us believe was a living saint as a parish priest. It was here at St. Mary's Parish that Father McGivney was a young parochial vicar during very challenging times. Things were very bad for Catholics in New Haven. It was a mostly Irish immigrant population, extremely poor, uh, many of them on the very borders of poverty. Um, disease was common. Early death was common. Father McGivney himself died at the age of 38. Uh, his pastor here, Father Murphy, died at the age of 34. So it was very difficult circumstances. He gave himself and poured himself out for the sake of, of the people that he was serving. So Father McGivney identified a couple great needs that the, the Catholic population had. One is because the men often died very, very young. Uh, you had many widows and orphans. And in those times, if uh, a woman was widowed and she could not prove she had a sufficient financial resources to raise the children, they would be taken from her and put, taken by the state and put in orphanages. And so you had this crisis of these families being broken up. And on top of that, because it was a very, very Protestant area, the Catholics were a very small minority, when these children were taken from their Catholic mothers, uh, they were not raised in the faith. The orphanages wouldn't do that. And so you also had the loss of faith. So Father McGivney saw that as a huge problem. Um, he also saw that many of the Catholic men who were around, the husbands and fathers, were enamored with uh, the secret societies that were popping up all, all around this area, many of which had either overt or at least covert agendas very much against the Catholic faith. And so the founding of the Knights of Columbus, uh, the, the contribution of Father McGivney's that's so familiar to many, was meant to address both of these circumstances, to give Catholic men a, an authentic fraternal experience where they could, as men, support one another, uh, grow in their unity with one another, and have a sense of purpose in the charity that they were to do. And on top of that, these men banded together, and should one of them die young, uh, the other men would pledge to financially support uh, the widow so that she would not lose her children and the families would not be broken up. Noticing the needs of the people, Father McGivney felt called to make a radical change in their lives. And that's when he started the Knights of Columbus, right here in the basement of this church. Father McGivney was a visionary way ahead of his day. Um, back in 19th century Catholicism, there was so much emphasis on the bishop and on the priests. Um, it wasn't yet the time where, you know, today we speak about the, the, the age of the laity. You know, they had the real leadership in the organization and he challenged them to step forward as Catholic men and take leadership in the parish and for the greater good. From that very first meeting of a handful of men in the basement of St. Mary's Church, it's incredible to think of how the Knights of Columbus has grown today and the outreach they have all over the world. To see how the Knights of Columbus now, today, uh, two million strong, you know, all throughout the United States and so many other countries as this great force, um, again, challenging Catholic men to step forward to be leaders in the faith for their families, their parishes, and for the wider society. As we've been hearing in the first part of Vaticano, the cause for Father McGivney started in 1997, and just recently, Pope Francis approved the decree for a miracle through Father McGivney's intercession. That miracle is said to have happened in Dixon, Tennessee. Brian Caulfield is the vice postulator on the cause and was responsible for gathering evidence and conducting interviews with the family about the birth of their son, 
Mikey Shackle. It was such a severe case of fetal high drops. Uh, it was a late onset in the pregnancy. It was complicated by trisomy 19, which is Down syndrome, and also coarctation of the aorta. And the mother was given the option of aborting at 19 weeks because the doctor said, I have never seen a case this serious go on to delivery. We have a case where we were told to kill that child because it wasn't expected to live or it wasn't going to have the quality of life that society deems as quality. You know, if there was ever a baby that Father McGivney would want to help, this would be the one. Dan and Michelle opted to go ahead with the birth and started praying to Father Michael McGivney. And today, their little boy is now five years of age. Today, the child is five years old, um, was not healed of the uh, Down syndrome. And this is an interesting uh, case. And I said, well, you know, if we're going to go to the Vatican to propose this as a miracle through the intercession of Father McGivney, one of the questions naturally is going to be, okay, the child was healed of one condition, the serious one, high drops, but the child was not healed of Down syndrome. So when I posed that question to the parents, they looked at one another kind of quizzically, like they couldn't believe I would ask this question. And they looked and both said almost simultaneously together, we never ask God to heal from Down syndrome. We only ask to be healed from the fatal condition, which was Hydrox, and he was. And I said, wow, that's amazing. They said, we thought, you know, we have 12 other children. We thought that a child with Down syndrome would be a great blessing. It would help all the other children to learn compassion, to learn love, unconditional love. And we've seen other families with Down syndrome children, and they are beautiful. Back in Waterbury, Connecticut, some local knights tell us about how the charitable work of their organization continues to serve those in need today, just as Father McGivney did when he walked these streets in the 1800s. I think the most important thing is our foundational principle, our, our charity, uh, being able to serve the community, help those less fortunate than us, and to be able to show pride in our Catholic heritage and, and living out that Catholic mission. Basically, there's a saying in the order that where there's a need, there's a night. And that's our mission, to fill that need in our community, whatever it may be. My family has been a knight for four generations. And in two of those generations, the family breadwinner died young. So exactly why Father McGivney started the knights to begin with has proven to be valuable and absolutely vital to my family's survival. The overwhelming sensation of giving a child, you know, they're coming in, it's cold out, and you're putting that coat on them, and it's just, you know, it's heartwarming. And then, you know, helping the homeless people, serving the soup kitchens and everything else, it's really a great, great organization of belonging. And just outside the city is the spot where the McGivney family are buried and where Michael McGivney was buried when he died in 1890, before his body was moved to St. Mary's Chapel in New Haven, where it now lies in a tomb. I'd say there's, there's more enthusiasm here in Waterbury than any other part of the state about the announcement of beatification. I come here at least once a week. I just feel a really close connection with Father McGivney and I'd, I'd really say a love, a love for him and to me it's like holy ground. Being here is like being on holy ground. The Knights of Columbus have spread the work of Father Michael McGivney throughout the world. And this year, the Vatican and the Knights celebrate 100 years of friendship. After the break, we will tell you about the Knights' traces in the Eternal City. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano.
The announcement of the beatification of Father Michael McGivney is marking 100 years of Knights of Columbus work in Rome. Well, we began in 1920 with the request by Pope Benedict XV to establish sports centers for the youth of Rome. So we've done 100 years of these sports centers, and even during the Second World War, we kept our centers open. These sports centers have supported several generations of young Romans, but the Knights are also engaged in the spiritual projects closely collaborating with the Roman Pontiffs. The Knights' work also included the efforts of the Vatican for the new evangelization. Thanks to the Knights, the papal events from 2010 are broadcast throughout the world through the custom-built mobile broadcast unit. The unit can support 20 high-definition cameras to beam indoor and outdoor church events to the world. The Knights donated well over a million dollars to make this purchase possible. Then there's been the work we've done with the Fabrica di San Pietro, which is the restoration and protection of the priceless works of art in the Vatican. And so repairing the facade of St. Peter is very important, various different chapels and works of religious art. The restoration of the crucifixes took more than 15 months of work. Layer by layer, the restorers revealed the original 14th century image of Jesus Christ, carved by the Italian artist Pietro Cavillini. The fourth uh, area of initiatives for us have been more directly in terms of evangelization, working with agencies such as the Pontifical Commission for Latin America, in ways of evangelization, also sponsoring different activities at many World Youth Days and other world meetings of families with the Holy Father. So those, I think, are the four general areas. Pope Francis welcomed the Supreme Council of the Knights of Columbus in February and praised their work for Rome and for the Church. I think we could narrow down his message to keep doing what you have been doing, that is, to be working in charity, uh, to be open and to be inclusive in terms of our works of charity, to continue to be a strong supporter of the Pope, which we are, and to continue to help in the work of the Church's mission of evangelization. So I would say uh, it was very, very warm address of the Holy Father to us and very meaningful to us. His particular attention to the Knights and their families shows a great respect for the importance of their work in the Catholic Church. The principles of the Knights hasn't changed since its foundation by Father Michael McGivney. Well, we were founded on the principles of charity, unity and fraternity. So if we reach back into history, the knightly virtue of charity, if you did not have charity, you were not a good knight. Also, a knight had to have fortitude, courage, to stand forth and, and work, live a life based on the Christian virtues, which we try to do as well. So I would say our principles, founding principles, charity, unity, fraternity, and then patriotism. From simple beginnings in 1882, the Knights of Columbus now count over two million members throughout the world and will soon celebrate the beatification of their founder, Father Michael McGivney. Thank you.